Hello lovelies and welcome, welcome, welcome to today's video. My name's Aylia and I'm so glad you stopped by. So today we're talking inherited eye disease. There are 350 different types of eye diseases that do have a genetic or inheritable component, um, which is definitely not something for one video. But I've just chosen two diseases today to hone in on and talk about their effects and what it's like to be a clinician with a patient with some sort of genetic disease because they can be quite devastating to the patient. I've also created this purple look using the beautiful Babs Glow um, by Double Down and using my Amethyst palette by Aether Beauty. So very, very, very cool. Um, so depending on what you're interested in, I hope you stick around and enjoy this video. So out of the 350 diseases that can be inherited, I'm going to be focusing on two specific ones today. The reason I choose these two is that they're my most favorite to read about the research. The reason for that is there's just so many promising developments in this space and it's really just fascinating and also really encouraging. There may be more things that we can do for these patients just around the corner. We're really just that close um, with some of these diseases. Um, then the main kind of buzz is around retinitis pigmentosa. Now it's a really interesting disease, it's a devastating disease and as a clinician I found it really difficult especially in the early days to separate myself from what I felt about the patient, you know my sympathy for what they're going through and the actual disease um, and with time I definitely learned that I was there just to help them with their eye care um, and it wasn't my job to be much more than just a listening ear um, but definitely not a counsellor or definitely not anyone more than just a source for, of guidance of where to find what they might be needing. So just a really good listener as well as somebody who takes a really good picture that will help um, doctors or physios or whoever it is that they need to really understand the disease and the, what the person's going through. So retinitis pigmentosa is where the cones at the back of the eye, in the retina, the cones are the photoreceptors at the back of the eye that are mostly abundant in the periphery, so on the outside of our vision, um, and they capture basically light. That's all they do. Their only job is to capture light. And they just degenerate. They die off um, with retinitis pigmentosa, um, and they often do that quite early on in life. Not always, but some kids lose their sight pretty much fully by the time they hit high school. Um, and others do make it quite far into adulthood, still being quite independent um, with their sight. From what I've seen in patients clinically, the experience of having something like a genetic disease can vary so, so much. That's kind of the point. They're your individual genes and the disease will present in its own unique way and in its own unique time format. It really doesn't ask anybody for guidance or direction. It just does what it wants. And when those light receptor cells die off in your peripheral vision, you end up with tunnel vision. You end up with no periphery at all. So things just really, really, really narrow in. And it often happens on two eyes at the same time or in a similar kind of fashion. So you don't really get like one sees for a lot longer than the other or anything like that. that don't typically get that much asymmetry as far as what I've seen. Sufferers of these disease have so much bravery, honestly, that from what I've experienced. These are people who you know, without any fault of their own, without anything that they've done in their lives, any choices that they've made, have just suffered a really, really, really bad card. Um, and the ones that I've had the absolute luck of knowing handle it with such grace. Um, you know, often at times it's people who will an advocate for the disease that will, you know, allow research to be done using their eyes. And a lot of can happen when you yourself forward like that a lot of progress can be made there are some really really great youtubers um, that talk about the disease that have the disease um, and that really fascinates me too to go out on a public stage and really talk about the things that you've experienced things that were obviously very negative experiences you know maybe there was bullying or maybe there was some kind of associated issues with being basically blind from a very young age and yet they have the unbelievable um, ability to just get up and talk about it and spread the knowledge and spread the awareness and just get on with it and it's just fantastic and the way they cope is just wonderful. Um, for us able-bodied people, you know, we could learn so much from people that have had, as I said, just a bad card dealt. 
because they just have an absolutely amazing attitude and approach, a lot of them. Um, and there's just so much wealth um, to their attitude. Um, if we could all <laughs> kind of take a leaf from their book when it comes to that, it really is so, so cool to see how resilient people can be, especially children. But back to the disease. So yes, the cells die. You can't um, absorb light anymore in the periphery and eventually tunnels in and you have nothing left. When you have no vision like that, what often happens is you end up with a kind of a replacement vision in a sense. So some people report seeing, you know, figures that aren't there. It's almost like their imagination takes over, but it's not their imagination. It's their retinas kind of just filling in the blanks when there are a lot of blanks there. So, you know, you still get sort of this retinal activity, but it's sort of happening very differently because it's not just like an on-off switch like you have with a television, for example, where one minute it's working, the next minute it's just off. That's not what happens. It's a really gradual decay. Um, and even though it feels like it happens in a really short amount of time, like only a few years for some people, the reality is, is a few years is a long time for a cell to be dying off. So you get a lot of these funny vision um, things happen. And it's scary and it's you know it's different far from something that somebody else can understand or imagine um, and because we're talking about sight issues it's not like you can draw what you're experiencing to explain it to your clinician so once again you really do have to become a really good listener um, and really hear your patient and you know really be their eyes um, and a lot of times their advocate for what they're trying to tell you because you can see the physical thing that's happening in their eyes but you can also see the person you know and, and the experience that comes with having that those particular set of eyes the other disease that really really uh, interests me um, is Leber's optic neuropathy different entirely different anatomy issue here also inherited disease this one is much more sudden in fact it's described as uh, a term called subacute so it's Acute, but not in like a few days acute. It happens in a short space of time, like a, say a year for some people. Or some people it could be a few years. Um, sometimes it can be one eye suddenly and then two years later the second eye, something like that. Always two eyes though. With the optic neuropathy, it's a different kind of vision loss. It's more central specifically and it happens typically in late teens, early 20s. So it happens at that sort of very specific space of time in life, which is also really, really interesting. You know, why is it happening specifically then? What in the eye's development is triggered specifically then? This is one of the diseases where it's super, super, super researched and it's really, really fascinating what they find. First of all, you definitely inherit it from mum and it's typically mother to son. Um, males are far, far more affected than females. Um, and you just have this disappearance, basically, of vision. So much more sudden and therefore a lot harder to sort of come to terms with. Not that this is any consolation, but they're very different diseases. One is a gradual, very quickly, but you know, relatively gradual loss of your peripheral vision, eventually your tunnel vision, and then eventually nothing. The people I've spoken to in person that experienced it were sort of late 30s by the time they were you know, at a point where they couldn't even sort of study your face, zero, blackout. Um, which is, again, it's horrible, terrible, but you have all that time to learn to master a cane, to figure out different tools, to potentially, uh, you know, work out guide dogs. You know, you still have some sort of extra functioning. With Libras, it's literally one day you see, the next day you can't really. And then it gets worse, and then eventually the second eye goes too. So it's a little bit more intense of a journey. The one beautiful thing with retinitis pigmentosa is, is that we have quite a few research projects going on right now looking at gene therapy and the wonderful thing about that is it's just literally around the corner that we're going to live in a time when these things are going to be no longer something of science fiction and become a thing of reality people can can already volunteer themselves to undergo some of these therapies um, and see if they can benefit at all from them the other thing is, especially in Australia, we have three organisations that are really kind of amazing. The first one of which is CIRA. CIRA is the Centre for Eye Research Australia, and they do basically anything to do with the back of the eye, retina. Um, it, they've got it. They've got it down pat. They do a lot of macular research. 
um, they do a lot of genetic stuff there really really fantastic fantastic organization and they're tied in with some really massive hospitals and universities so there's a lot of things going on a lot of movement in different theories and different researches happening through them another really fantastic organization and there'd be one in most countries that's sort of a version of this and that is the guide dogs australia so guide dogs not only do they do what the name suggests train seeing eye dogs but they also provide um, occupational therapy and life skills um, you know different different vision um, tools depending on your disease and your type of vision loss to really help you stay independent and in your own version sighted because what I've learned from my short stint in low vision care is that sight doesn't always depend on what your eyes are doing it really doesn't we do have other senses that's the main thing um, and the other thing to really remember is that most diseases, perhaps not with retinitis pigmentosa, but most diseases don't take 100% of your sight. They take large sections out of your sight. But they also then leave remaining patches, which can totally be utilised, at least in the short term. Um, and it can definitely help you to have some peer support as well. Because when you attend such organisations, you'll definitely be meeting other people in very similar situations as yourself. So I just love this these type of organizations for the most part because they really create a community and a support network. The last but not least, by far not least, is Vision Australia. So Vision Australia, as far as where I use it clinically, I refer people to Vision Australia for guides and aids. My favorite thing for low vision, what they do, especially for where I work, I mostly deal with age, uh, aging population, age-related diseases. Um, they do, you know, um, things like CCTVs, so it's a big old screen that can blow up any reading material. Um, they do all different devices. They can teach you how to use your, you know, your smart devices to benefit your site. All those really, really cool things. So it's a really, really amazing thing that we have all these really just brilliant organizations um, at our fingertips here in Australia. Um, and I just feel like they're underutilized by clinicians because either people have to stumble upon them themselves um, or they get referred on, but they don't really know what they're asking for when they get there. So I really make it my business to not just refer to the organization, but refer with a purpose. So at least it gets their foot in a door with a purpose. Once they're there, they can be guided by the clinicians there. But initially, when they first come in, they really need to know which questions to ask. And it can be really, really difficult to know what to ask, especially if you've not got the ability to, say, read about it first or research it yourself, because in my case, not because my patients don't see so well, but they're at an age where computers are not necessarily second nature to them, like it could be with younger generations. The main thing to note with genetic diseases is they affect the different functional parts of the eye. Um, unlike sort of other diseases that are, you know, lifestyle induced or drug induced or um, just degenerative, there's not a lot of time with these genetic diseases to come to terms with what you're experiencing. Um, that's another thing that I feel like as a clinician is my job to really navigate around the person's experience. Keeping it real, you know, don't promise anything that's not going to happen. That's probably the main take home message. You know, I hate when people come in and say, oh, I've been told that I can do this research and I can have this treatment and I'll, you know, potentially get my sight back. I'm a little bit sort of straight when it comes to that sort of stuff. I sort of say, look, I'm going to keep my eye on every single new bit of research that comes out and as soon as you're eligible I'm going to pick up the phone and give you a call but leave it with me because it would suck so much for these patients with their limited vision or their limited abilities to sit there and try and navigate research which is heavily scientific language um, and think that they might be suitable and just to learn that they're not. It's devastating. It's already devastating to have your vision loss and then to also find yourself constantly being rejected for different things that are coming up for different technologies. So I try and take it upon myself to really, really read the data. And if I see that there's any patients that kind of correlate with what's being written in the different magazines and different emails that we get to update us on the research, or sometimes there's calls for volunteers with certain um, criteria, if I've got a patient or patients that would suit that criteria, I'm on the phone. I'm telling them this is going to happen, that they can do this, and this is the, you know, trying to really sort of decipher things on their behalf. It really is an interesting space because there is constant movement. There's constantly new 
theories and technologies coming into play. So no matter what country you're in, if this is something that affects you, I would definitely get stay in touch with somebody who's involved with all of this sort of stuff so they can at least keep you in mind. They can have you on their books should anything come up to suit your particular eye problem. It's specifically really interesting what they're going to do next for Leber's optic neuropathy because in this disease, it's not the actual photoreceptors that die. It's the nerve cells that relay information from the central vision. So initially, people experience a cloudiness or a loss of focus, definite a loss of color vision um, or color perception, uh, and then eventually color vision loss uh, and central vision loss. So faces, reading, driving, anything that's, if you think about it, just like a, the absolute opposite of early stage retinitis pigmentosa, you've lost the middle, whereas with retinitis pigmentosa, you've lost the periphery and it gradually curtains in. With optic neuropathy, in this particular case, it won't take the peripheral vision. So it's a little bit different in that respect too. But the amazing thing is that these two diseases will require very different technologies. They're treating very different types of cells, um, but yet they're both genetic diseases. Um, or inheritable diseases. So it's just really, really interesting to keep on top of that data and that research space to see what they're really doing, whether it's stem cell research or genetic therapy or, um, you know, learning what actually causes those cells to die and then perhaps supporting them. Maybe it's just a vitamin deficiency or some sort of issue with vitamin take up. It could be so, so simple at its basis, but the mechanisms by which these things are happening, that's what really needs the research, the science, the support to make changes and headway with these diseases. All right, my lovelies, I hope you found this to be interesting. Um, it's definitely a big old gray space um these diseases they're not necessarily so well known um this is not the space i work in at all in low vision i'm definitely much more in geriatric health um or general ophthalmology but i just find it absolutely riveting um how much technology has moved on in just my 11 years as an orthoptist um so you know and plus the several years of university before that so much has changed so many new things are constantly popping up in the literature and it's very exciting we're living in a really exciting time when it comes to progress in health and healthcare. if you like today's video don't forget to give me a like um, leave me a comment and tell me what other diseases interest you i'm absolutely happy to talk about any and all of them <laughs> eventually we'll cover them all one day if you want to learn more about other diseases there's a whole catalog of things on this channel that you can watch through maybe I've already covered something that strikes your fancy if you want to check out more things about desires creations and the more creative part of my life please go ahead and check out Instagram there's things going on there all the time if you haven't yet subscribed go ahead and press that big red button turn that thing gray um, and join the creative family wherever you are around the world lovelies I hope you're having an amazing day and I can't wait to see you on the next one bye Thank <laughs> you.